Name's FCG, mon ami. Remember it. It's been a while since we've done one of these. The last time was the first time Bell's Hells fought the villain Odahan Thule. And spoilers for Critical Role Campaign 3 in general. In that first battle with Odahan Thule, half the party died. So, obviously, the party were reasonably nervous when, in this latest episode, they encountered her in her place of power. A place where her psionic abilities are probably way, way stronger. Fighting her once again, seven on one, when she killed a player character immediately. Now, that death was not permanent. Chetney, played by Travis Willingham, came back to life soon after, but FCG, the party's cleric, realizing that Odahan could not be beat, FCG, they sacrificed themselves, and it was, it was quite tragic. It was quite sad, and I was going to make a video. I was going to make a video talking about their sacrifice and talking about how Sam Regal made everyone care about his character and made the cast cry in that moment. I mean, I've never seen so many tears shot in Critical Role other than like the ends of campaigns. It was a well done death. But then I went to Reddit. I know. I know. Okay. I, I get it. it. That's on me. I know. But well, I saw a lot of people talking about how tear-jerking the episode was. I was shocked by how many people talked about how controversial the episode was because I didn't get it. I tune into Krill Krill Campaign 3 every once in a while when I'm pretty sure something big is going to happen, and in this case, I was right. And yeah, I didn't really see the big fuss about this combat. I mean, I was playing Cyberpunk while listening to the session, so I was a little distracted sometimes. But the point is, I didn't get it. But as I read the post, I slowly saw the picture starting to form. And that picture is something that I talk about quite often. The picture is difficult combat and how some people really don't like it when player characters die. And today, we're going to be talking about it. We're going to be talking about some of the common criticisms of this latest combat of Critical Role and why I don't think Matt Mercer did anything wrong in this case at all. I want to exaggerate, by the way, that this is a small vocal minority. I'm pretty sure most people really enjoyed this session. I've seen a lot of praise for it. I'm not talking about some big controversy here, but I am talking about something that I see frequently in TTRPG culture and some things that I want to see changed, or at least things that I think are doing DMs out there a bit of a disservice. So without further ado, guys, let's get started. Okay, so for those of you not in the clear here, let's establish what the heck is happening in this fight. It is a one on seven boss. The party are for the most part fighting just Odahan. She has clones and echoes to back her up through Echo Knight abilities, Dunamancy that she has access to, as well as psionic powers. But for the most part, yeah, this is seven player characters against the singular Odahan Thule, empowered upon the moon of Ruidus, her psionic abilities at peak. A legendary warrior and fighter feared across the lands. Yeah. She's an intimidating badass. And Bell's Hells at this point are mid to high level. They're doing pretty good in terms of power. They're not a min-max party by any means, but a lot of them have accumulated some pretty potent powers over time. Okay, the stakes are set. This is supposed to be a difficult combat. Odahan is a legendary figure. She's not going to go down like some chump. And Matt Mercer made her in a way that facilitated that. She had access to multiple action surges. Her psionic abilities were way beyond what any player character could dream of. She was beyond any boss the players had faced before and far beyond each individual player character themselves. And the hot take that I saw was that some people were bothered by this. Some people were bothered that Odahan's abilities do not match what fighters can do normally, what psionic fighters can do normally either. For example, abilities that target one creature can now target multiple, what the heck? Action surge, that can only be used once per short rest. She shouldn't be able to use it multiple times. What is this? Cheating from the dungeon master? Fudging your rolls? I mean, fudging your rolls doesn't really apply here, but some people were saying that anyway, which I think was dumb. Anyway, why does this bother me so much? Because I am sick of people thinking that monsters and player characters need to be made the same way and have access to the same abilities. That is 
dumb. I think it is a symptom of how WotC has designed a lot of spell casting monsters. A lot of spell casting monsters don't have access to custom spells or abilities that are unique to them. Instead, they have access to abilities that player characters also have access to, and rules as written work the exact same way. Which, by the way, I do not like. I think it is a weakness of game design when you just reuse existing spells for monsters. Like, yeah, sure, stuff like Thaumaturgy or Prestigitation or Sending, like, these spells that are pretty generic, I'm okay with adding those utility spells to monsters, but when it comes to offensive or defensive abilities, stuff that's actively used in combat, I would far prefer to use a monster manual with custom abilities tailored to the creature's design. That is so much more appealing to me, that's why I praise MCDM's Flea Mortals so much. Odahan did something that I also really like taking existing player character abilities and modifying them to work for a monster, changing them to fit a boss rather than a player character. The point of a player character is to exist in the party. D&D is made to be a party game with player characters fighting against monsters. That is the way the character creator was made. And therefore, the character creator is not meant to be used for monsters. I think furthermore, it is a complete disservice to your players and to yourself as a dungeon master if you try to jerry-rig the character creator into making monsters because that's not what it was for. Why? Well, number one, let's take Odahan for example. If she was just a 20th level fighter, she would fold against Bell's Hells. I mean, yeah, it would be pretty challenging, I guess, but at the end of the day, one 20th level fighter ain't fighting seven player characters, unless they're like level one to five. Player characters start getting some pretty impressive burst damage once you start getting the higher levels. And Bell's Hells, they're not 20th level or anything, but I mean, they have impressive abilities, like I said before. And unless Odahan can deal appropriate damage, substantial damage to force them onto the back foot, force them to burn turns on healing spells, force them to retreat, force them away from her, she's just not going to stand a chance. My point is that if she was just a player character, this fight would be a joke. Of course Matt needs to change their abilities. One of the top posts of the Krill Krill subreddit, for some reason, was a guy postulating that Matt must have made some kind of mistake that Odahan's enhanced abilities were just an oopsie on his part. He didn't mean it. He didn't mean to make this boss so difficult. No, dude. He probably did. I mean, I can't read his mind, but Matt is not bound to the rules of player character creation when it comes to making monsters. That would be silly. I think using player character creation rules for monsters is an active mistake. He's not making a mistake by fixing that. He's not making a mistake by doing what, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many other dungeon masters, is best practice. Enhancing abilities so that they fit a boss. Yeah, her abilities are going to be able to target multiple creatures. She is a singular fighter fighting seven people. If her abilities were only single target, if her psionic powers could only affect one person, she'd be a joke. Odahan is not powerful because Matt made a mistake or because he was evilly trying to kill his player characters by, by fudging her existing abilities. No, she was designed in a way to make her realistically challenging against Bell's Hells. The dice simply weren't in their favor. There was a lot of missed attacks, a lot of failed ability saving throws. There was a lot of reasons why that fight didn't go their way. In fact, even though the fight wasn't going their way a lot of the time with a lot of failed dice rolls, they were still doing pretty good. I mean, she was almost dead multiple times. It was only when she drank a big old healing potion that she managed to get back on her feet. Something that, as a dungeon master, I actually wouldn't do. I actually disagree with Matt's choice here to give her that healing potion. I think she was powerful enough as is to be a reasonable threat. But Matt made a different call there because he's a different dungeon master from me. This is the other reason why I think a lot of people got their knots in the twist over this whole situation and over Critical Role in general. I mean, there's a whole subreddit that seems dedicated to picking apart every little decision that Matt makes and every little choice made by the cast to see if it's entirely optimal. But frankly, number one, a lot of people don't play like that. And, and number two, we're, we're all human. 
okay? We all make decisions that other people are going to disagree with. I mean, to me, giving a monster a healing potion is usually unnecessary. I wouldn't do that. I just increase their base health from the beginning and call it a day. But Matt made a different call. A call that I wouldn't have made, but a call that, in my opinion, is still valid. I mean, it's just a difference of opinion on how the game is run. People run the game differently, especially since... Mercer is under a pretty specific set of circumstances. The guy is running a streaming show with seven players. I think people who are casually in the know about Dungeons & Dragons, or people who just play D&D and have never DM'd, who watch Critical Role, are often those people that get all twisted over the things that happen in the game, not understanding the restrictions. I mean, just at a baseline, Matt's DMing for seven people. That's freaking hard. Like, I don't think people talk about it enough. Matt Coville made a whole video where he talked about how people talking about D&D is usually really stupid because everyone assumes that everyone else is under the same circumstances, playing with the same people, and most importantly, the same amount of people. People have gotten upset at me for pointing this out, which just boggles my mind, because I'm sorry, dude, this isn't my opinion, it's just the truth. If you can't accept it, that is not my problem. But every table is different, especially because of how many people are there. Seven people is different from three. You need a different design philosophy in order to balance for it. And frankly, in my opinion, the more players you add, even one more person is gonna make your game more difficult to run. It gets harder. The more people there are, the more play styles need to balance, the more abilities need to factor into your encounter design, it becomes a pain. And the fact that Matt has done this for however many years Critical Role has been going at this point, what was it? Where are we at? Like over seven? Matt here was trying to make a combat that is kind of overtuned. I mean, Odahan is supposed to be the deadly threat. I mean, okay, Ludinus is the, the deadly threat, but Odahan is you know, the other deadly threat. She's this legendary warrior that is supposed to be unparalleled. She shouldn't go down like a chump. It should be a hard fight. I think that's why he gave her that healing potion. That's why he had that in her inventory, because he knew that, yeah, this is one person fighting seven player characters. The potion is basically mandatory in order to make sure that she has an appropriate amount of hit points to fight them. The point that I'm trying to get at is when you're balancing around seven people, you need to make a lot of decisions to make the combats thrilling and interesting, especially since Matt's got a camera in front of him. He needs to make this thrilling for the audience too. A lot of people just don't think of that. They assume that every decision made by a dungeon master is made to cater to the players. And yeah, they are, but that doesn't always mean letting them off easy. Sometimes that means kicking their butt. And in this case, that is what he did. So now, Let's talk about the other reason people are upset. The last time Matt Mercer killed someone permanently, it was the first time. And obviously for a lot of people who are watching Critical Role for the first time and don't play a lot of D&D, a lot of people were upset that Molly Mock died permanently. It was a lot more of a backlash back then than now. I think more people are used to the concept of player character death, especially since Laudna also died. But FCG going down? I mean, they're the party cleric. They're the person with Revivify. And while, yeah, Fern also has Revivify, unfortunately, FCG sacrifice in this case left them unable to be brought back. And yeah, that's tragic. But I also think that's good. We often talk about how DMs and players need to play ball with each other, how players need to sort of suspend disbelief sometimes or maybe just kind of follow the DM's lead a little bit when they're getting into an adventure. It's that whole thing I talk about. You can't play Curse of Strahd if you don't go to Barovia, that kind of thing. The players need to play ball with the DM, but it works the other way around. DM also needs to play ball with the players. Some people were asking why FCG Sacrifice actually killed Odahan. It shouldn't have from a math standpoint, which I actually think is dubious. I looked at some of the math that people were doing online. I did the math myself and it checks out as long as Odahan doesn't have resistance to FCG's explosion, at least to my estimation. Again, we don't pay the math budget here at Crispy's Tavern. I could have done things very wrong, but my point is that if I'm right and FCG sacrifice only works if Matt takes out the resistance Odahan has to damage, I still think it actually is a well-made choice. Matt was playing ball with FCG. I mean, his core is freaking overloading. He turned himself into a nuclear bomb. Odahan has damage resistances, but like, this is a pretty particular situation where I think those resistances may be overridden. I mean, there are plenty of monsters I throw at my players that override their damage resistances. Why not this? 
If Matt was fudging or making a decision last minute just to save the party, I mean, what other situation are you going to do that? I mean, the Dungeon Master's Guide itself talks about fudging as a reasonable option. And if you're going to fudge anywhere in your campaign, it's in a situation like this. A situation where people are literally crying over a player character's death. Invalidating that, I think, would have been an irresponsible choice, or at least a missed opportunity. I'm not saying that having a tragic, pointless sacrifice is bad for D&D games. I mean, hey, maybe that's a plot point you're interested in. But Matt's decision here is also a good one. Pretending it's a bad one just to keep the sanctity of the game balance and making sure everything and all the numbers check out would be ridiculous. This sacrifice was well done. Sam Regal made an epic decision that made the story so much more impactful. And invalidating that? Sure, the tragedy could have been interesting, but is it the only decision that's valid? Hell no! Matt Marisha's decision here was a great one, and played ball with a player character death. Yeah, player character death is touchy, but I don't think it should be this touchy. When a death is well done, I think we should acknowledge when it is well done, and if anything, I think a lot of us should envy it. Of course, a lot of people, most people, like this moment. I saw countless posts weeping the death of FCG. I mean, Twitter was mourning their loss for so long. I think they still are at this point. And good. I think that's good. But I do think that vocal minority also matters because it is something that affects D&D &D games. DMs are afraid of killing player characters. I mean, I'm afraid of killing player characters. I think that's a big reason why it often doesn't happen. And I think that in a lot of games that fits, but if you're playing a game where you tell your players like, hey, player character death is possible, make it actually possible. Even when we clarify that, there is some fear there because of that vocal minority, because of how many people get upset at moments like this one. I think it discourages DMs. It discourages DMs from having difficult combats in the first frickin' place. I see it constantly, and I don't like that. I hope that this combat, this epic moment, and the love that erupted from it can overcome the whingers out there and encourage DMs to try a more difficult and tense playstyle, to try a style where consequences are permanent, where death is possible, and where the best choices come with heavy consequences. I love moments like this. I love tragedy. I love drama and trauma. And obviously, if you don't want that in your game, that's cool. But if you do, I hope this encourages you not to be afraid of traumatizing your players, as long as they're cool with it as well. Alright, and that's a wrap. I hope I've left enough room that we can do a sequel to this video talking about why FCG works as a character and why so many people cared about them, even though for a time they were actually pretty controversial. But in any case, until that next video, if you guys enjoyed this one, please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our RPG Horror Story series, where we talk about actual bad things in Dungeons and Dragons. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own tips or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment smiley day to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you all next time. Farewell. But because she...